So, the main introduction of the, the Bayesian probability uh, makes in this, in this context is to uh, is to use Bayes' theorem for making some of the quantities in, in Bayes' theorem the parameters of the model. So, writing down what we would like to get out of an experiment is we have, if theta represents the parameters of the model, so theta, in my notes at least, will, I think will always represent the parameters of the model, omega matter, bubble constant, or whatever, whatever it is, and x of the data. So given the data, what is the probability of the, uh, of, of the parameters of the model? So to compute that, we use Bayes' theorem again. So let's write down Bayes' theorem, and that allows us to reverse the order of the conditional. Um, just to say that although I won't always write it down, uh, these probabilities are always worked out in a particular framework, so there's a particular model that you have in mind for this parameter inference section. Uh, so there's an implicit dependence on the model here. Um, so this is all given models of given lambda CDM or whatever. And also given any prior information that you might have from previous experiments, for example. So uh, it's uh, implicit that anything that you've learned up to that point is also included. <clears throat> so let's have a look at this um, expression. The term on the left is called the posterior, so that is the probability of the parameters after you've done the experiment. That's what you're looking for. It's written in terms of the probability of the data given the parameters, that's referred to as the likelihood, multiplied by the probability of the parameters, that's called the prior, um, divided by a term which is called the evidence, or it's sometimes called the marginal likelihood in the statistics literature. So, that's basically just what I've said. Is this readable at the back? Is that too small to be read at the back? So I can make it bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay? Um, so let's just have a look at this and think about it a little bit. The thing on the bottom looks a bit strange. It's the probability of the data. What does that mean? What is, what is the probability of getting the data? Um, if you're doing parameter inference, you can essentially ignore it because what we're interested in is the relative probabilities of different parameters, uh, or relative probability of a parameter uh, taking different values. So if you take the relative probabilities, then this term at the bottom uh, cancels out. It's basically just a way to normalize the, the probability. So if we want to normalize this probability so that this really is, does integrate to unity, then uh, that's what the, the evidence does. It does play an important role later, come to it in a minute, uh, but just to say if you do want to normalize it, then if you, then P of X is just the integral of the top line. So if, we did, if P of X is defined like this, which it is, then uh, that automatically ensures that the probability distribution, the posterior probability distribution is normalized, so it integrates to unity. Um, it does play a role, we'll talk more about this later on in the week, uh, in model selection problems, and it makes its role a bit clearer that if we, if we remember that all of these probabilities we're interpreting in the context of a theoretical model, so the P of X really means what's the probability of getting the data given the model that you have. Um, and it could well be that if you, if you have two different models, Lambda CDM and Brainwave, say, that one of them has very small probability of actually giving you the data that you've got on the other one, may have more probability. Uh, so. so let me just um, pause to think a little bit more about this, because this is a, this is a really key part of the uh, scientific inference. So if we ignore the evidence for the time being, so we're just considering a single model, we're not comparing different models, but we're working, say, with lambda CDM. What is the the probability of the parameters of the model is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. So let's have a look at the, the, the prior. So the prior here represents our state of knowledge before we did the experiment. The likelihood is the probability 
probability of getting the data that we got. Um, and so that will, this probability may be high for certain values of the parameters, but there may be some values of the parameters which uh, make it very unlikely that we've got that data, those data. And the posterior is, uh, is the product of these two, and it represents the state of knowledge after we've done the experiment. So, we hope that we've learned something from the experiment. So we started with some state of knowledge around the parameters, P of eta. We did the experiment, calculate the likelihood. We multiply these two together, and that gives you the probability of the uh, parameters given that you've done the experiment. So hopefully you've learned something if that this, this probability is a narrower distribution than what you started with. So the, what the experiment allows you to do is, is, in a sense, to update your prior. So you have some prior knowledge of the parameters, you do an experiment, you learn a bit more. So you can now uh, use your posterior as a prior for the next experiment. So it will give you the, the information that you have your state of knowledge before the next one. So this idea of calculating a posterior and regarding it as a way of updating your prior, so it's basically updating what you know so that your, your, your state of knowledge has hopefully improved. So uh, is this a... One thing to check is that this definition of probability and this sort of interpretation makes sense. Um, so, um, we can show that it does, we can show this mathematically if you like, we're not going to do it. Um, but we have, let's say we do two experiments, um, then we can do one of three things, or all of three things. We can define the prior, oops. Uh, if we define our prior before we've done the two experiments, we can then obtain a posterior from the first data set, so we update the prior, and use that posterior as the prior for the second data set. And then our state of knowledge will change again and uh, we can then uh, define it with the, with the posterior. We could do the same thing but in reverse order. If we have two data sets, we could do, we can analyze Planck and then we can analyze BOSS. Or we should get the same answer if we analyze BOSS and then analyze Planck. Okay. The other thing that we could do is to define the prior and then analyze the joint experiment of BOSS plus Planck, for example. Um, and uh, if you, you know, if this makes any sense, then you should get the same answer. Your state of knowledge, having done the two experiments, should be the same, whichever procedure that you uh, follow. And these do, these have to and do give you the, the same answer. So the, the rules of the probability are, are consistent. Okay, so let me give you a little diversion on priors, uh, because priors are the things that frequentists get most worried about or most unhappy about. More or less everything that we do is conditional on our prior information. So regarding the experiment as updating your state of knowledge, then you have to define, you may have to define what your state of knowledge was at the beginning. Um, and uh, that's uh, will sometimes lead to issues we'll talk about we'll talk about that in a moment. But let me just uh, test your intuition about priors. How many of you play chess or know the rules of chess? Most people. Okay, so here's a, here's a chess position. What's the probability that white wins? It depends. Okay, so it depends whose who's move it is next. Okay. So what would be a reasonable prior to put on the probability of the next move? What would you think? Half? Half, yeah. Okay, so that seems perfectly reasonable. If I've got no other information, then a sensible prior would be to say, all right, I don't know who's next, whose move it is next. Let's put a prior of a half on it being black's move and a half on it being white's move. Uh, okay, so that's a sort of simple, simple answer for that. But let's have a look at this position a little bit more closely. Um, if it's black's move, Sorry, if it's white's move, what was black's last move? Let, let, 
let's just explore whether it's reasonable to say that the probability of it being white, white smooth is, is a half. Let's, let's say it is white smooth at this point. What was black's last move? Impossible. Agree? Impossible? Actually not. It looks like it. If you move the queen... So it's possible that uh, white moved his queen to that point if the king was on the black square to the right. But why didn't he take the queen? If it was really on the black square to the right. Yeah. So so then why did black not just take the queen? And then it would have been a draw. So there's actually some more prior information, which is that black knows the rules of chess. <laughs> but black actually doesn't want to lose. <laughs> It's actually more subtle than that because it's possible that there might have been a knight in the corner. If there was a knight in the corner, then black could not take the queen, and the only option was that black took the knight in the corner. So, you know, there's, there's, there's actually layers and layers in this very simple problem. And there's other primes, you know, is this a game where the, 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 the aim is to win or to lose? I mean, there are versions of chess made trying to lose. So, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's actually lots and lots of prior information that you bring to bear. Um, prior information in this case also about the, the knowledge of the moves of the, of the pieces and so on. Okay, so uh, I've got until 10, now that's the next So let's have a look at uh, some of the other terms. So, so in order to work out the posterior, then we need the uh, the likelihood, so the probability of getting the data given the model parameters. So, uh, in the context of cosmology, if, if your data consists of the power spectrum uh, estimates from a CMB experiment, then we need to have a way, theoretically, of, giving, of working out the probability of, giving the, uh, of giving, getting the, the, the data. So, there are codes, Boltzmann codes, which will do that for you. So, uh, you run those codes and those make theoretical predictions for what the mean of the power spectrum signal should be. So these are examples where the parameters have been varied. Um, so given the, given the uh, uh, errors on the data points, then um, you can see that some of these values of the parameters will be highly disfavored by the data. So the probability of getting the data if, for example, over is equal to 1, or over which everybody this is, but uh, uh, well, let's, let's say how look at these. Um, if you change the barrier density, you can keep everything else fixed, and the height of this peak changes. So there are certain values of the barrier density which will not be able to give you a, 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 a theoretical code which is close to the data. Okay, so in order to work out this probability, then you need not just to get have the the theoretical curves, but you need to know what the uh, what the what the errors are. Strictly speaking, you need the whole of what's called the sampling distribution. So the sampling distribution is a, a generalization of the likelihood. So it's the probability of getting any set of data given the parameters of the model. The likelihood refers to the probability of getting the data that you actually have. Okay. Uh, so the quantity that appears in here is really strictly this should be the sample distribution. The likelihood is a strange thing because it's regarded as a function of theta. So these probabilities are really probabilities as x given theta. So they are probabilities of getting the, the, the data. So they're normalized so that if you integrate over all possible data, you get unity. The likelihood is a slightly strange object treat it as a function of theta, and it's not strictly a probability distribution because it's not normalized. If it was a probability distribution as a function of theta, then if we integrated the likelihood with respect to theta, we need to get unity, and it doesn't actually um, 
75. Okay, so depending on what your experiment is, then you will have either a Boltzmann code or an n-body simulation or whatever that will, in principle, give you the, uh, the probabilities of, the, uh, of getting any, any given data set. So that gives you the sampling distribution, which helps, helps you to calculate the light image. Um, there's one. So let, let me just give you a uh, a case study uh, again to illustrate the difference between doing this in a Bayesian way and a frequentist way. Um, very simple problem. If you have a set of data that are drawn from uh, a distribution with a certain mean, and your goal is to infer what the mean of the population. So we have a set of samples called x i. Uh, same, same dispersion. So we'll assume that we have uh, Gaussian noise. So that the the errors are a Gaussian with a dispersion which is sigma. And you, the, the question that you want to know is what is the uh, what is the mean of the distribution? So the first thing to write down, rule one, is what you want to know. Well, you want to know the posterior probability, the probability of mu given the data set. So that's the quantity you need to uh, compute. Um, that, that would be the Bayesian perspective. A frequentist would do something different. A frequentist would try to get an e make an estimate of the mean. So you take the data and you try to estimate what the mean is. So um, a frequentist would go to some trouble to make sure it was a good estimator, one that was unbiased, that didn't give you a result which is uh, too small or too large. On average, it would, it would be correct. Uh, and it would also have as small an error bar as possible. So you could do this, uh, instead of for you as a, as a problem, not for now, but um, uh, to, to, to do this. Um, so we want an unbiased estimator and a minimum variance estimator. And if you do these two calculations and work out what the probability of the estimator is, and this posterior probability, you get exactly the same formula. But the interpretation is very different. So let me just sketch how you do this. Uh, so the model for the data is that the values of the data x are given by the mean of the population plus some noise, some dispersion around there. The data is a set of values, xi, say. Prior information is that the noise has zero mean and that it's variance is known. And it's gas distributed. The parameter in the problem, theta, is mu, it's the mean of the population. And rule one, what we want is the uh, probability of mu given the set of x's. Okay, so if you do that calculation, I encourage you to, to do it, it's, uh, you end up with the posterior for mu is, uh, is a Gaussian. Um, which is centered on the average of the data. X bar is 1 over n times the sum of the values. So that's just the average of the data. And it has a width which is a, a, has a variance of sigma squared over n. So that's the formula. What a frequentist would do would be to define an estimator um, and uh, by making it unbiased and making it minimum variance, then the estimator would be, the, the best estimator would be just the average of the data. And you, you can work out what the distribution of that estimator is. So if you do the experiment again, you're going to get a different estimate. So it's, it's, a, it's a random quantity. Um, and if you work out what the probability of the distribution of the, uh, of the estimator is, it's exactly the same formula. It's a Gaussian, identical. But the interpretation is very different. For a free, free basis, then the this is the probability of the estimator given the true value of the mean. So the estimator is scattered around the mean with a Gaussian with a uh, signal over the 10. The Bayesian interpretation of this would be very different. It would be that the Given the average of the data, the x bar, then the probability of the true value is a Gaussian which is centered on the average and with the same, the same width. So it's the same formula, it 
interpretation is different. And I would argue that actually this is the quantity that we want. That's the question that we would like to ask is given, given the data, given the average of the data, what does that tell us about the, the mean of the population? Um, so it's worth just paying attention because as I say, sometimes you do this in two different ways. You get the same answer, so it seems that maybe there isn't a difference, but actually the interpretation of the result is, is completely different in two, in two cases. So we've talked a little bit about priors. Um, I wanted to just have a little diversion into uh, the effect of priors. Um, in easy cases, then the effect of the prior is generally rather simple. Um, and what often happens, what usually happens, always happens, at least asymptotically, is that as you get more, collect more and more data, then the influence of the prior becomes less and less important. So if you have enough data, so that the likelihood is really sharply peaked, then the, the prior tends not to be important anymore. Unfortunately, in cosmology, that's very rarely the situation that we're in. We're rarely in the situation that the data is so constraining that the prior is not important. So, um, what sort of prior should you choose? Well, if, if changing your prior to another reasonable one, if you, so sometimes you have no previous data to work on that would constrain uh, the parameters at all, in which case you, you have to make a choice about the prior. Uh, I'll give you some examples in a moment um, of uh, ones that you might choose. Um, if, it, if the answer did matters a lot, then probably you should try and get some more data. What would be reasonable? Well, we can try some, a prior which is not very informative. Clearly, if we take a prior which is very sharply peaked at a particular value of the parameter, then uh, that's making a very strong statement about our state of knowledge. If we, if we have no knowledge beforehand, then what should we do? Well, a constant prior, one which is basically uniform, in much the same way as we said for the, for the chess game, if we don't know anything, let's say the probability of black and white having the next move is equal, that seems reasonable. Same sort of thing could appear here for the, for the case of the mean here, if you have no prior information, you would give it a prior which is, is just uh, uniform, all values are equally likely. Um, in some cases you can justify a prior which is not uniform, if you have a scale parameter, so let's say that you had uh, say something like a power spectrum, where it's something that you know has to be positive, then a reasonable, another reasonable prior would, would be to say that you've no idea which decade the power spectrum exists in. So every, every unit of log of the power spectrum is equally likely. So you don't get to within a factor of 10 uh, what, the, uh, what the value is. Uh, so is it a uniform uh, prior in the log of the um, I've put a star here by this non-informative bit here because there's, what counts as non-informative, there's, there's quite a, a literature on, uh, on this, so it's better just, I think, just to state what your priors are and not necessarily say that they're uh, uninformative. So the important point is to state what your prior assumptions are, and the, the importance of that is that if you start from the same prior, then the results that you get are not, they're not subjective. Um, given, the prior, given the prior that you have, then everything else follows in a way which is uh, completely objective. Uh, so the basic reasoning is not subjective. Subject to the prior, then everything else is, um, is uh, determined. So let me give you some examples. This is taken from Sidia's uh, book, or Sidia Stilling's book, showing some uh, Throws of a coin. So here we have an experiment where we throw a coin and record whether it's heads or tails. And the question we want to ask is what is the probability, uh, what, is the, what is the probability that the coin lands head? Is it a fair coin so this has a 50 50 chance? So in this case, we start with the uniform prior, assume that uh, the the, so the, the, the parameter, so the parameter of the problem. The, the prob probability of it being hex, uh, prior probability of it landing uh, as, 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 as hex. Uh, so a fair coin would have a value of a half. But if we wanted to test a coin, let's 
say, would allow all possibilities equals. So we throw it once and we get an head. And then we update our prior. And if you do the calculations, then the posterior is just a straight line like this. If you have one head. If you throw it again and it's another head, then the posterior gets looks like this. So this would be the prior of the next experiment. Ah, then the next one is a tail. Posterior looks like this. You keep on throwing many, many times. If you throw enough, then the shape of the posterior ends up like this, uh, maybe Gaussian shape, not centered on a hop. So this experiment was a, not a fair point. The probability of it coming out heads is only about 0.3. So let's do uh, another experiment. Well, same experiment actually, but we start with some different priors. So let's start with uh, three different priors. There's the one that we had before, the uniform one. <coughs> then there's two other priors. There's one here which is centered close to a half with a certain width. So if, if Leitra were doing this with you, then you'd think it's bound to be a fair coin. You know, very strong suspicion that she's an honest woman, whereas if you'd got the point from me, you would have been instantly suspicious. You would have thought this is likely to be a fix, a fix. So let's give it a prior which is very highly skewed towards it always coming up heads, almost always coming up heads, or always coming up tails. So a prior which would look like this. Do the same experiment, get the same, uh, the same result. And uh, the first time you throw a head, that more or less knocks out this tail here that says that it more or less always gives you a tail. So, uh, so the posterior after that is one sided if you've got the point from me. It hasn't changed very much with features prior. Do the experiment many, many times, eventually you end up with something that looks like this. So here, uh, effectively, for the case where you've been very suspicious, then very quickly you knock out the, these tails of the probability because, because essentially the evidence just doesn't support the idea that you always get a head, almost always get a head, or always get, always get a tail. So you end up somewhere in the middle here where the, where the prior is, is fairly flat. So in that case, the posterior distribution looks very, very similar to what you've got when you start to look flat. But if you thought that the if you have this really strong prior belief that the coin is more or less fair, then uh, it's, uh, the probability is still actually still quite close to, uh, to, to 0.5. With 64 trials, it's moved a little bit to the left. So with a very strong prior, then you need to, uh, then the uh, likelihood can take up many, many trials in order to move you away from that. I think in, uh, in CDO2 in the books, Book, I think there's a, this goes up to maybe a thousand trials, and if you do a thousand trials, then this posterior ends up uh, looking, looking like the, uh, the, all the posteriors end up looking the same. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more in due course about marginalization, that if, we, if we're inferring many different parameters, as we typically do in cosmology, you want to know the, the, the distribution of a, uh, a, a, a one of the parameters only, then uh, you marginalize over the other ones, and you'll have seen these long plots of uh, the marginal distribution of two parameters when everything else has been uh, marginalized over. And that's done by simply integrating over all of the other parameters that you're not looking at. Um, I think I'm going to skip this because I know that we're just going to talk a little bit about. Marginal likelihoods, and I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'll, I'll skip that. And just give you another uh, another lesson to, to be careful. So this is this is an experiment called a very small array. It was a, a CMB experiment in Cambridge um, some years ago, uh, about 2000. Uh, and what this shows is uh, the probability distributions for a lot of cosmological parameters. Uh, from the PSI. So there's various things here, the dark matter density, the Hubble parameter here. Let's just concentrate on the Hubble parameter here. So, um, 
So this experiment looked at the sky, and you'll notice that there's quite a nice result on the Hubble parameter that the posterior distribution here is, uh, has a nice peak at around about 0.7 with a width of something like 0.1. Um, so this is an experiment where the priors were set, so there are various priors on these parameters. Um, probably there were hard priors that set the parameters had to be of the ranges that were that are plotted, uh, and some other reasonable priors that the cosmological constant is positive, and that the age of the universe is somewhere between 10 and 20 GD years. So reasonable, reasonable priors, um, quite sensible. Uh, and these are the results. Now, these are quite interesting. Most interesting thing about them, perhaps it's the Hubble parameter, quite nicely constrained, um, 0.7 plus minus 0.1. But the interesting thing about this is that there are no data in this at all. So what they've done here is just to draw samples from the prior. They haven't, haven't used the data at all. So the likelihood is basically just a constant. Um, the posterior is, uh, and the prior are basically just the same. And they're just marginalized over everything else. So in marginalizing over all the other parameters, leaving just a function of h, you get this really nice result. Now, why is that? The reason is that these priors, which sound quite reasonable, end up cutting off in this multi-dimensional parameter space. Parts of that parameter space are not allowed because they don't conform to this, this prior. So when you integrate over the, the uh, parameter space with these constraints, then just the volume in, in the parameter space uh, is, uh, uh, can influence what the marginal distribution so just, uh, just a word of warning that you can write down some fairly reasonable priors and it may be that your answers are actually being determined more by the prior than they are for the data. They certainly are in this case because there's no data. So you should definitely look at seeing what happens if you modify your priors and see if there's some, any sensitivity to the priors. I should say that uh, if you do include some data, which they did, these distributions look uh, much better and more informative. So some of these, if you just look at the prior, for example, the spectral index is basically constant, but once you, uh, once you include some data, then the spectral index doesn't indeed get outdated. So. <clears throat> OK, so you do your experiment, you update your What do you do with it? Um, you have a distribution of like these of the of, uh, of, of, of the parameters. These are the posterior distribution. Really, in essence, this is the outcome of the experiment. That's the information that has come out of the experiment, and, and really, that's the object which uh, is, is, is the encompasses all of the information, everything that you've learned about the parameters having done the experiment. So this is really the product, if you like, but very often people like to um, encapsulate the answers, to summarize them in a simple way. And um, you don't need to do that, necessarily. In some, in some cases it may make sense, in some cases it may not. But if you do, then commonly the mode is used, so the most likely value of the parameters, the peak of the posterior. And it also coincides with a maximum likelihood estimator if the prize is unit there. You can also use the mean of the distribution. So since it's a probability distribution, you might perhaps prefer to use the mean of the distribution, the mean of the posterior. Um, but you have to be a little bit careful, I'll show you an example where it doesn't make sense. Um, and you can also present different ranges which give you the ranges where you have a certain amount of posterior probability of the parameters. Nietzsche will say more about this uh, later. These are called credibility intervals, sometimes called Bayesian confidence intervals. So that's, they're different from the frequency. I'll skip that. You're going to talk about this, I'm running out of time, so I'll skip it. Um, just to give you a 
a warning about using the mean of the distribution. Um, it makes sense to characterize the posterior if it's, if it's a single peak which looks vaguely Gaussian, then characterizing it by the mean and the variance would, uh, uh, would make some sense. But you do get multimodal distributions, and very often for good physical reasons. So if you're looking for photometric redshifts, for example, uh, then very often you get, you get two peaks in the, in the distribution, one at low redshift and one at high redshift. Coming from the fact that a typical galaxy spectrum has two breaks in it, one, one line break and one bar break. And as you get into the source, then this moves through the bands. And this can be some degeneracy because the, the broadband colors may be uncertain as to whether a break in the, in the colors is due to the, the line break or the bar break. So you won't very often get two solutions which are uh, both reasonably likely. So this is the uh, I don't know whether you can see this in the back, there's, there's a peak in the, in the likelihood here. So this is the likelihood um, with a peak of high redshift, around about redshift 3, and one at redshift less than a half. Um, so the galaxy is either here or here. It's not somewhere in the middle. So this is actually a likelihood. Um, you also have some other information in this case, prior information from the brightness of the galaxy. So you know that it's actually galaxy is probably much more likely to be at low ratio than high ratio before you look at the colors. So with that prior information, then the, the posterior uh, then uh, is, is, is large at low ratio, but there's this little peak at high ratio. So some possibility that the, the two breaks have been confused. If you took the mean of this distribution, then, well, if you took the mean of the likelihood, then you'd end up with something in the middle. And that would actually make no sense at all in this case. So the galaxy is certainly either a high redshift or a low redshift, but it's not in the middle. So this is an example where you, you certainly should not, uh, uh, not, not, not do the, uh, take the mean. So let me finish in just a moment. Let me give you uh, a problem for you to take away if you have an idle moment during the day before tomorrow to uh, do another problem. So here's, here's one of the advantages of taking a Bayesian approach is that you can, you can make inferences even if you only have a very small amount of data. For example, if you only have one universe, you would maybe like a thousand universes to do good statistics, but we only have one. So here's an extreme example where you can do inference when you only have one data point. So the, the situation is that you have a radio source which is a with a telescope that can detect sources with fluxes above a certain value S0. Uh, the radio source has a flux S1, which happens to be twice S0. There's no measurement error in this. Um, it's precisely measured. Uh, what is the slope of the number counts? So the model that we have is that the number counts are proportional to some power of the flux. So even with a single data point, we can make an, uh, we can work out the posterior for the slope of the number counts. Remarkable. So there's your exercise. See if you can do that uh, uh, before tomorrow, and I'll give you I'll give you the solution uh, tomorrow. Okay. So let me just uh, summarize, just very give you a very brief <coughs> summary of uh, how you typically approach this sort of parameter problem. So first thing to write down what it is that you, that you want to know. So typically it's the probability of the parameters given the data that you have and any prior information you have and given a model. So firstly think about what is the model that you're working within lab of CDA typically. Um, what are the parameters of the model? In Latin CDN, they're obvious. In other problems, may not be so obvious. So think, think a little bit about what, what constitutes data, what constitutes parameters in the model. What prior information do you have? Uh, and, um, and, um, and, and, and take it from there. What we'll come to later is the broader question of what is the probability of the model given the data that we have. But uh, we'll come on to that another time.
Okay, so I'll stop there. Um...